All right, can everybody hear me? I'm good, right? We can hear and see you, Connor. Thank you. Good deal. Um, well, um, once again, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today and be able to uh, to uh, talk about this cool research we have going on with alligator snapping turtles. So I'll just get right into it and then we can talk about it afterwards. So um, um, give a little, is this working? Uh -oh. One second. Yeah, I'm still seeing your title page, Connor, if that's what you're. Yeah, that's what worrying. I'm trying to look at. It's uh, not going anywhere right now. Let's see. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so, the alligator snapping turtle is the largest freshwater turtle in North America. Um, the species inhabits. Uh, River and stream systems across a wide geographic area throughout the southeastern United States. <clears throat> but despite this expansive range, uh, the species faces several threats and the species is currently proposed for listing under the endangered species act. Um, 1 of the reasons for this is that populations of alligator snapping turtles are thought to be vulnerable to over harvest as they're often sought out for food. Um, or die as incidental bycatch from limb lines and trot lines. Um, and while they are protected from harvest here in Texas, where they have been protected since the 1980s, uh, they are not protected in neighboring Louisiana, in which you can legally harvest one per day per vessel. And so one of the consequences of this disparity in protection and regulation and is that local populations have declined, and this has also encouraged illegal harvesting in protected areas. And so, fortunately, law enforcement agencies have become more aware of this trade in recent years, with state and federal agencies coordinating large investigations into this illegal trade in Texas. Um, these efforts led to a significant bust in 2016, when state and federal agencies confiscated around 30 alligator snapping turtles from smugglers in Louisiana, who had poached turtles from multiple areas of Texas. Um, and so while uh, enforcing the law and getting the turtles back is obviously a good thing, it raises the question, what do we do with these giant turtles now? And so in this case, uh, these turtles were moved to the National Fish Hatchery in uh, Natchitoches, Louisiana, where they were kept in the hopes of establishing a captive breeding colony for future conservation efforts. However, in 2020, collaboration between TPWD, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, some other stakeholders, and then SFA um, ultimately led to the idea of trying to repatriate these turtles back into Texas. And so the scope of this project is really to see, is it feasible to rep repatriate poached alligator snapping turtles back into native systems? Um, if we could reach a stage where repatriated turtles could be released back into Texas, we wanted to answer this by determining movement patterns of repatriated alligator snapping turtles post -re release and across seasons, um, determining their microhabitat selection uh, across sites and seasons, and then really importantly, estimating their survival over time. And so we knew that repatriation efforts of, of reptiles, especially large reptiles, are often not successful, and that releasing animals that have been in captivity for long periods of time can also present many challenges. So to ensure these potential risks were considered and managed for, we kind of attacked this by dividing our repatriation efforts into these three phases. And so this first pre-release phase, uh, we need to ensure that we knew where these turtles came from and where they could go, uh, which included genetic assignment and site evaluation at potential release sites. And then a release phase in which demographics and health evaluations of the turtles could be considered before putting them through the stress of transport and relocation or potentially releasing diseases into local populations. And then a third phase of the post-release phase in which we could continue or we, we could monitor these turtles to answer the, 
the questions I just mentioned. So for the pre-release phase, genetic analyses were performed through collaboration with the Tangled Bank Conservancy, who analyzed blood samples of not only these captive turtles destined for repatriation, but wild turtles uh, for all over their range, but mostly in East Texas, and found basin level population substructure in East Texas. And so that means that we were able to basically assign these turtles to three drainages, including the Natchez, Cypress, and Sabine drainages. And so once we knew what drainages the turtles came from, we conducted four to six preliminary surveys in each of them to assess habitat, determine the presence and absence of alligator snapping turtles at those sites, and to try to try and assess the density of these wild turtles at these sites as well. And then for the release phase, all of these individual turtles were first assessed by a licensed veterinarian inspecting body condition and the presence of disease, like I previously talked about. Um, we also recorded morphological measurements and demographic information for these turtles, depending on their health approval. And then we bolted on transmitters with temperature sensors, which were fitted on the marginal scoot at the rear, uh, rear of the carapace with bolts and locking nuts, and then applied epoxy to further secure the radio and reduce drag. And so out of the 30 turtles originally proposed for release, 23 were approved for repatriation, loaded into wetted burlap sacks and transported overnight to uh, release at three different sites, the Angelina Natchez WMA in the Natchez system, the Couch Mountain, Couch Mountain Ranch, some private property in the Cypress River system, and then North Toledo Bend WMA in the Cypress system. And so just a comment here before we get further into the talk. And so one of the problems with these kind of repatriation projects is the idea that you're, you know, you're getting these turtles, right, is you don't, you, you can only deal with what you have, right? And so you can see from this graph right here, this is basically just a count of the, um, female, male to sub-adult ratio, and you can see that it's uneven. We have one site where it's almost all sub-adults. I just wanted to mention that now. <clears throat> and so after their release in June, uh, we started obtaining weekly fixes on repatriated alligator snapping turtles, and a fix was considered appropriate to include um, in our analyses if we could locate an individual within one meter. And so at the turtle localities, we collected a suite of microhabitat variables within a three meter radius of the turtle location. This included variables such as water depth, water temperature, canopy cover, flow rate, percent cover, various structure, et cetera. We also measured microhabitat variables at random points paired with each turtle locality by selecting two paired distances from a randomized list with either distance and cardinal direction for oxbows and wetlands, or distance upstream, downstream for rivers and streams with a distance from the bank. And both of these distances were between three to 100 meters to ensure an individual could have selected for that microhabitat but did not. And so we've been tracking these repatriated turtles for almost a year now, and we have started to see some interesting results. So on the x-axis on this graph represents time in which telemetry tracks correspond to the week, uh, zero being the initial release and week 45 being last week. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the average distance moved between checks of repatriated individuals at each site. The red line corresponds to the Angelina and HSWMA, the green with Couch Mountain Ranch and the blue with North Toledo Bend. And so what we observed is that there was this kind of freakout phase immediately post-release. Um, 
with turtles, but after about week five, we see these turtles establishing themselves in different areas and decreasing their movement by the end of the summer here. Um, this trend of decreasing movement continued throughout the fall. And by the time winter months were here, they were barely moving at all. Uh, oftentimes less than a couple meters from their last location the week before. However, we've found recently that as soon as spring was here, they ramped up their movement greatly and at least two of the sites they've started to move more than they did when they were first released just about and the other site i'll explain in a minute the couch mountain ranch site i'll explain why we have not seen that spike yet and so even with the initial spike in movement we saw post-release, uh, the way they're moving now suggests that these turtles can make some long distance movements occasionally over a relatively short time period. For example, this is uh, NTB3, uh, it's a, uh, or AND3, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a smaller male who was originally released down here in the south at this red uh, star, red star down in the southern end, bottom of the, of the map here. <clears throat> and he hung out within this general area uh, through the fall and winter, but in the early spring vanished to start working his way up uh, here to the north at that other red star where he was caught on a trot line by a local fisherman 22 and a half miles from his last known location. Um, he was released safely by the fisherman and we were able to keep tracking him where he's decided to settle in up there now where he's now, you know, in another area that he's not moving in that much. And so, um, despite seeing some seasonal consistencies with movement patterns, we can also see that the demographics of what we released may have had an effect on things as well. I wish I could point at this, but I let's see if this will work. There we go. Okay. And so, for example, we tend to see somewhat consistent patterns, but you can see at our Cypress site here where there was a lot of subadults released, we had much greater movements at that initial freak out phase, but they basically found their areas in the river and they're not moving that much. And so, um, it's, it's, it's hard to tell, um, but is it could be possible that some of these subadults aren't sexually mature, maybe they you know, don't don't have the same behaviors as some of the larger adults. <clears throat> and so we don't see any significant differences in movement patterns at this site across seasons, except for the summer. <clears throat> kind of switching gears here, thinking about their microhabitat use. So right here is a uh, non-metric uh, multi-dimensional scaling analyses um, where we're looking at basically multivariate data of microhabitat variables um, of the AST look taken at the AS AST locations, the alligator salmon locations, and then the random locations. And so what we tend to see is that alligator snapping turtles are selecting these types of habitats along these two gradients where they really like so for example structure is very very important to them but at the same time these low flow areas with lots of structure but at the same time there seems to be kind of a sweet spot with depth where they're always found between you know a meter to 2.1 meters and so they typically avoid these areas like this deep section of the river here where they don't have a lot of structure. Um, you don't see any undercuts on the banks. Although when they will go into other wetlands and stuff, the same thing kind of applies. There's still this kind of sweet spot, even in the wetlands, they're closely um, associated with the structure or at least with some kind of vegetative uh, cover here. And it's the same thing applies for the depth. And so this pattern is basically consistent at our site or at other sites where you're seeing the same thing, uh, where they're preferring this kind of sweet spot of 
structure, depth, low flow, um, uh, undercuts or eddies, these, these types of things. And so, for example, at this site, you see them preferring the same types of habitat that I was just describing. And in this case, this, this site being a way more smaller river system, avoiding the super, super shallow areas with no structure, which I think intuitively makes sense um, for a large turtle that needs cover. However, the, we still get some weird stuff too. So, for example, we don't really see any kind of separation between the alligator snapping turtle locations and the random locations in North Toledo Bend. And one of the reasons we think this is happening is because they're utilizing these oxbows that are just become so homogenous due to the Salvinia invasions and things like that. And so basically they're still using like cover, but they don't need to use it as much because this provides kind of like a blanket. And so basically the random points and the alligator snapping turtles are basically the same. So <clears throat> and then utilizing data from the temp sensor where you can get ranges of their temperature from the sensor plus water column temperature range. So basically the surface temperature minus the bottom temperature. Um, we were able to kind of further explain like this preference for this kind of sweet spot is probably being related to temperature. And so you can see from this, from these box plots right here, that there's significant differences between these, the temperatures at these selected sites versus the random distributions. And you also see significant differences between seasonal temperatures, which is expected, but as you can see, they have these alligator snapping turtles are selecting microhabitats that are probably warmer in temperature and all those other microhabitat variables probably influence that, but it's also within a fairly narrow range. And so we see this pattern consistent at our Couch Mountain Ranch site, and we also see this fairly consistently in North Toledo Bend where even when it's cold, they're going to find those warm areas and they're usually within a very narrow temperature range, even within seasons. And so probably the most important thing that we really wanna know um, has to do with their survival. And so one of the, one of the kind of things about survival with this species is well, how do we look at survival when this animal can basically outlive you, right? That it outlives the people that research them. And so we've started to do some kind of survival estimation with the data we have. And so um, basically right off the bat, a year in, we have five confirmed mortalities and five unconfirmed. And by unconfirmed, I mean they weren't found after the initial release. They were released, they disappeared, we searched the area for a substantial amount of time and distances, and we just never were able to pick them back up again. They just took off and just completely, uh, completely gone. And so within that, we have two mortalities that basically are uh, Angelina Nature's site, two in our Couch Mountain Ranch site, and then one in North Toledo Bend with two unknowns in each of those. And so using the recapture data from telemetry checks, uh, we can estimate survival of these repatriated turtles across time and by time them estimating across weeks. And so to do this, I um, performed some Kaplan-Meier non-parametric analysis. And I also uh, did some stuff in R Mark with Mark with Mark recapture data. So you can account for these unknowns and like if you lose something and if you find it again, you can incorporate all these things into the model to get a better idea. And so when I did this, I assumed that survival probability was dependent upon site, sex, time, carapace length, and initial capture. And then these models basically were selected using AIC to find the best fit model. 
And so what I found was, is that the survival probability was really high when excluding those turtles immediately after release, which makes sense. They're missing turtles from each site, you're, you're going to increase your survival probability if they're not included in the analysis. And so what you can see here is that it's basically really high, right? I mean, for the species. So it's around, you know, 0.7 survival probability by, by now. Um, when included, survival is still high, though. It's still greater than 50% and it's lower limit. Um, however, it is important to notice that there's wide confidence intervals here, and that's most likely due to just sample size, like having to go out, not having many turtles at some sites. Um, it's really, it's, it's a really a, a long-term investment to, uh, to try to do these survival estimates. Um, what is interesting though, is that we can kind of see already that we can see kind of, um, places along this year where your survival is, is kicking in and incorporating that, or your uh, survival probability drops. And so you have initial release and then you have this, uh, loss of survival or lower survival probability, excuse me, uh, in the winter. Or beginning of winter. And so when I looked at more depth into the uh, survival uh, estimation, uh, sex and site uh, models uh, were the greatest or were the best models to support explaining survival probability. Um, and so you can see right here, this is our, let's see. Yeah. Right, so you can see right here. In this uh, survival curve, that females typically had higher survival probabilities across the year, with males having a little lower survival probability, and then subadults having the lowest. They, most of them uh, that did experience mortality were gone at initial release. And so, looking at the sites, we can see that uh, Angelina Natchez and North Toledo Bend. Both still have high survivor probability, but also the Couch Mountain Ranch site is being influenced by those subadults to where we're having lower survivor probability there. And so the results we found so far are consistent with some other ongoing studies in investigating uh, movement and microhabitat selection of wild alligator snapping turtles. So for example, wild alligator snapping turtles in Buffalo Bayou decreased movements in the summer and winter months, increasing their movements again in the spring. Um, despite the initial spike in movement post-release, we observed um, these repatriated alligator snapping turtle movements were similar to this study in terms of monthly distance and ranges. <clears throat> and then also, the seasonal shifts in movement might also be uh, influenced by life stage. So, these non if if there's a subadult that's non reproductive, if you have, if an animal takes 18 years um, to be able to reproduce or reach sexual maturity, it's pretty hard to tell sometimes with the subadults if they're actually reproducing or not. And so, there might be something going on here. <clears throat> And then, of course, wild alligator snapping turtles and repatriated turtles seem to have the same affinity for similar microhabitats, abundant large structure, and this kind of sweet spot of water depth um, that's most likely related to temperature. So um, other studies have shown that temperature is probably a strong driver of their habit microhabitat selection. <clears throat> However, there may be variation in movement and microhabitat selection between sites. And so we have a unique opportunity here because we were able to repatriate turtles at three different sites that are all pretty different from each other. <clears throat> and so furthermore, um, we observed high survival compared to other studies on large reptiles. Um, there's been some stuff done with alligator snapping turtles and juveniles. Um, where they also found that small, like juveniles had uh, higher survival 
or I mean, uh, uh, lower survival over time. And then the survival probabilities of repatriated alligator snapping turtles also might be influenced by these seasonal climatic conditions at the initial release and in months of low activity. So when it gets really, really cold and the spring's coming and you got to switch, switch that on and be able to move, um, it's really important to uh, use those low activity or find the right places in those low activity months to survive. And so, in saying this, males likely have lower survival probabilities than females due to just the energetic cost of finding mates and territories. So it seems like males move a lot more, and so therefore more energetic costs, lower survival. And then life stage may also be a factor limiting long-term survival as well. So body size limitations might be preventing resource acquisition at some of the re at repatriation sites. And then subadult turtles may have habitat requirements that are not really present at the at the site that they're released at. Um, and so to kind of just wrap this all up, um, you know, knowing that these repatriate effort, repatriation efforts could eventually be a useful tool for like future conservation efforts is kind of exciting. And so we know that the removal of 2% of females can lead to, or females from a population can lead to a substantial population decline. And so it's a really interesting situation to have all of these female turtles that were once in Texas poached and now are going back. Um, and so through this, you know, these repatriation, repatriation efforts um, may be able to bolster wild populations of alligator snapping turtles. And so we're not really done yet. Um, and so right now we have funding to do some long term radio tracking of uh, these guys uh, alongside uh, wild alligator snapping turtles at the Angelina Nature Stand B site. And so we're planning on putting radios on 10 wild turtles, five males and five females. And in addition to that, we're going to. Um, attach a couple of satellite link GPS tags on females uh, to just kind of test the feasibility of this to see if we can get points um, on them when they surface or to maybe catch nesting events. And then ultimately, we're going to be able to compare and contrast movement patterns, microhabitat use, and survival of both the repatriated and wild turtles in the same system. So it's pretty exciting and we'll be tracking those turtles. Once we get all of our wild turtles out, we'll be tracking for another three years every week. So. And so with that, I uh, would like to thank our funding sources, Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Texas Comptroller Office of Public Accounts, the Sabine River Authority, the Northeast Texas Municipal Water District, and the McIntyre Stennis Program through the USDA. Um, also, lots of people to thank for logistical support and site access. This was like one of the craziest projects I've ever worked on because it was so collaborative and cool and there's just so many people interested involved and so many people helped to make this happen. Um, and so with that, I'll thank um, all the guys from TBWD, Phil uh, Adams, Bob Baker, Cody Dunnigan, the guys at ACE. Um, and then all the guys through the uh, different water authorities, including the Sabine River Authority, Bill Kirby at the Sabine River Authority, Robert Spate at the uh, Northeast Texas Municipal Water District, um, Nelson Roach for private land access to Couch Mountain Ranch, and then of course all the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service guys that we've uh, worked close with on this as well. And then all of the field technicians and other support we have a ton of people here at SFA that are really great and they get out there and they work really hard. So I like to thank them. And with that, I'll take any questions. And also, if you want to see a cool video on the project, you can scan this QR code at the bottom of this bottom left of the screen right here. Thank you, Connor. That was great, man. Um we do have some questions. 
So the first question is uh, about the movement graph that you showed early on. And it says, was the graph of movement for all, t all turtles, or do you know if there was a difference between male and female movement during the spring? Hold on a second. Say that one more time, I'm sorry. Was the graph you showed uh, for all turtles, and do you know if there is a difference between male and female movement in the spring? I think the question is getting at, do you see more movement in the females, you know, associated with nesting or males looking for mates? If, you, right. if yeah. there's we, any differences. We tend to see these, we tend to see, see the, the issue is that um, most of our turtles are female. So you're dealing with some issues there with like, uh, can you really say some of the differences between sex really? But basically, the, when the largest movements are always made by the males, females tend to stick around areas for way longer, and they tend to travel a lot uh, smaller distances to get to new places to settle into, where males will actually leave an area, go miles, miles upstream, and eventually come back to that same area. And so, um, one of the other cool things this thing is going crazy right now. Um, there it is. Okay. Uh, so one of the cool things too that we've noticed is that we actually have um, uh, a repatriated male at uh, Steinhagen at Angelina Natchez who visits females that are also repatriated, multiple of them. He travels back and forth a couple miles down the river. And so that's brought up some interesting things with these things being in captivity for so long. If there's some kind of association um, that they formed, you know, in captivity in that small pond that they're kept in. But in, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, in general, males tend to make the largest movements. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they move more often. They just jet and go move a long distance and then they'll settle in another area. No, that's great. Uh, there's lots of questions here asking for reminders of how many were released. Uh, I think at each site and sort of different uh, life stages. I think you had a slide on that, didn't you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so basically we released 23 turtles. Uh, we had originally we had eight turtles released, five males and five females at the Angelina Neches site. The Couch Mountain Ranch site was five kind of considered subadults, one, only one male and two females. And then North Toledo Bend, we had four females and two males released and then added another two males to that. They were released at a later, later time because they were either, um, they were still held by US Fish and Wildlife Service. So. That's great. Um, another question, will any BMPs developed during this research consider housing holding juvenile turtles until adult status? Oh, yeah, great question. Oh, you're saying to, um, yeah, if juvenile survivorship is juveniles and letting them put on size and become adult. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good. Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I've, I, there's, there's at least 1 study on. Uh, they did kind of some translocation stuff with juveniles, uh, alligator snapping turtles. Um, you know, I, I assume that like a lot of other translocated kind of situations or translocation situations with turtles that the bigger you are, the better off you are. And so basically what I've seen is that hard releases are typically, you know, usually negative, but. I mean, you know, they've had some success. It just depends on the species. That's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I assume that they do okay in captivity. I mean, they lived in a small pond all together, and I'm sure they messed each other up a little bit, but, um, you know, six years in a small tank is a long time. So, you know. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, sort of captive acclimation may be the other concern on that side, but who knows if that's 
as big of an issue in this circumstance. Sure. Okay. Uh, there's more questions here. Uh, did the extreme cold weather conditions in Texas last year skew the survival data? Oh, no, we released at, the releases were done after the cold weather, right? That was February 2021 and we did the, the release was done in June 21. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that wasn't an issue that was done after. Okay. What was the main reason the turtles did not qualify for reintroduction? Uh, I assume that means kind of, you know, there were some individuals that were not. Sure. Um, well, that's the turtles that did not get reintroduced. The major large majority of them, they were never found. They were, they were turtles that had escaped. The uh, facility basically, and couldn't really do anything unless they showed up. And when they actually did have one turtle that was released later, that did finally show up, but. Uh, but most of those turtles were, um, if not all of them, were just a matter of they weren't there when we had to release them. If, if memory serves, there were a couple that on the genetic assignments didn't there get assigned back to Texas, right? It's, it's true. There, there was a couple questionable ones in there as well. Yeah. At least one of the ones from Couch Mountain Ranch was, or one of the ones that was released at Couch Mountain Ranch was a, not a Texas turtle. Or that was going to be released there. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, what was the cause of mortality identified in any of the five that were found? Um, yeah, um, yes and no. So it's pretty hard to determine the mortality. Uh, we try to do our best. I mean, a lot of times these things are like, you know, under stuff in a river or something, but. The ones we found, one of them appears to be just like an incidental, like, uh, just tired. I don't know if it like tired itself out and got stuck, but it was hanging out in this one spot for a long time and it tried to venture out and it went right back. And then, you know, I ended up finding its shell like underneath this log jam basically. And so it wasn't really hung on anything or anything like that. It just, uh, I wonder if like a flooding event. Because we had a lot of rain come through there at that time, I wonder if a flooding event had actually caused that turtle to drown in this big uh, log jam. The other one um, that we had a uh, our biggest turtle actually um, die, and it was released later. Um, there was just there was nothing we could do about it. It couldn't be even released until later, and I wonder if it was just the uh, the stress. Of being released later when, you know, the temperatures are starting to cool down and. You know, there was some signs on that turtle when we first got to it, there were some signs that it probably had some negative interactions with some other large males. In the, uh, in the oxbow, it was released in, but I mean, I can't say for certain, but there was definitely evidence of that. Yeah, oh, great. Um. Well, here's a good one. Was there any lab work conducted to screen for pathogens or was it just a visual health inspection by done by vets? And of the animals that were not cleared for release, well, why were they not cleared? Um, I can have a stab at that one, Connor, if you don't, if you don't yeah, mind. Oh, sure. Um, you know, we went back and forth about this for a long time. We The, the main vet on the project that we worked with was uh, Joe Flanagan from the Houston Zoo. He's kind of long history working on turtle veterinary issues and he consulted with a bunch of other people and ultimately after going round and round in circles on it we decided that um, because we had a pretty good understanding of the chain of custody of these turtles um, in terms of you know where they'd been since they were removed from the wild and because they'd been in kind of a quasi quarantine at the hatchery in Natchitoches for a few years we felt pretty comfortable that um, you know they weren't they weren't going to have uh, anything that was going to be super detrimental. Um, you know, I'm sure most people, especially the person asking that question, knows we don't really know a lot about terrible diseases, the distribution of them, which ones we need to be worried about and all that. And so, yeah, we really felt like um, with the chain of custody information, the sort of level of mortality the turtles had experienced in captivity, that a, you know, the, a visual examination was sufficient. We did take and bank blood 
for sort of future disease work should the, should the need uh, become apparent to look into that stuff. Um, but yeah, it was just a screening. And we did, there were several um, turtles that had been propagated at the hatchery that were not released. Uh, so I think there were maybe 10, you know, two, three-year-old turtles uh, mm. in total. And I think we released three of them. They didn't get telemetered or anything because they were too small. But I think a, a, couple, a lot of them didn't get released. I can't remember the exact numbers now off the top of my head, but they were um, the vet, the vet. Joe doing the inspections determined that, you know, they had poor body condition. They were kind of puffy and had some inflamed um, parts on their um, sort of legs and arms and stuff. And it could have been, it could have been about, you know, the concrete line tubs and all this stuff, but we felt like it wasn't worth the, the risk at the time. And so they, they found a forever home somewhere else. If that answers the question. Okay. Uh, Connor, on the slide with survival probability by sex and sight, did that include the non-confirmed mortalities? Okay, yeah. Did it did, did it have all the data, or was it just the sort of confirmed mortalities that you included in that particular analysis? Right. So there, in this one right here, you mean? Then I think the next slide where you do the site. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, one, so yeah, this this included um, this included the unconfirmed, but in the actual model that I did in Mark and stuff, I tried to account for that by having um, if if they were if they were gone from the beginning, they were left out. But if they were gone for a significant amount of time and rediscovered and stuff, I tried to I incorporated that into the model. If they like were found again, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so. Only the only the real mortality basically were included in this. Great, we got a lot more questions here. They're coming in. Um, have you considered including movement, uh, distance moved, meters per day, etc., in the survivorship models? Uh, yes, actually, there's there's some other interesting things I really want to look at uh, with the survival stuff. Like there's some really maybe some neat stuff I could do, uh, just the way that they're using the landscape. I could do some stuff with incorporating this, um, number of wetlands they're using or a number of like tributary tributaries they're using within their range. But I absolutely want to include that in the future. So I'm hoping that, you know, once we, you know, we'll be finishing up a year here. And so once we get basically rolling for the next few years, I feel like we'll have a a decent enough data set to really incorporate a lot of that kind of stuff, get some interesting stuff. But to answer your question, yes, like absolutely. That's great. Um, what baseline data, if any, did you record, did you collect on the turtle populations at the reintroduction site? So as part of the sort of site selection process? Right. So when we did surveys, um, we basically all of our surveys are standardized to um, uh, what's been done for the last 20 years. And so uh, all of that baseline data, we collect all of morph metrics. So this includes all the different shell measurements, um, mass, all of this, sex, uh, the all of these things. Um, we also take biopsies and blood samples from everything as well. Um, I, I, I guess, does that answer your question? You're asking kind of what we're, what we're like basing things off of. But the, yeah. One of the difficulties, I think maybe with that question too, one of the difficulties is like, it's really hard to adequately sample a population of these things, right? Before you can like say, oh, well, you know, this site is perfect or this site isn't right. So you're kind of constrained with those preliminary surveys. You just kind of kind of have to go do it. The ba I mean, the, I guess the idea is that you don't want to put turtles where there are no turtles, but the habitat looks good, right? And on the flip side of that, you might not want to put, you know, drop all these turtles in this one oxbow lake if there's just a ton of big guys floating around in there as well, too. So it's kind of, it's kind of like a touch and go thing, I guess. That's great, Connor. Thanks. Um. Can you determine if any of the released turtles were repoached again? Ooh, 
Oh, that would be uh yeah, I I I cannot confirm that. Uh if any of the turtles were poached again. Yeah, any of the releases were, you know. Yeah. Back up again. I could drive yeah. the uh I could drive the Louisiana border with a uh intent <laughs> out the window. Maybe. Um yeah, okay. uh, I do know that uh, the interesting thing is, like, you know, I'd never seen it getting caught on trot lines until recently. I was way more nervous about repatriated turtles getting hung up on trot lines than I was about them being poached. Because the good thing about where we're at is, or where our sites were, is that the turtles are pretty protected. Now, that being said, they they like to travel many, many miles, and they'll go over into Louisiana and stuff where they're they don't even have to be poached. They can be legally collected. So, um, but yeah. Okay. So it's kind of a more general question. How often do females breed and how many eggs are laid per year? Oh man, I'm not even sure on that to be honest. Um, Kind of caught me on that one. I yeah, see. we can. I'm, I, if, I'm sure there's somebody out there. That I've seen some uh, some names of folks who who have studied this turtle quite extensively. So if anybody else wants to answer that question in the chat, then I can, yeah, I can read that out and answer that and answer that question. Um, was there any success in breeding in captivity? Uh, yes, there was. I'll answer that one. Yes, there was a little bit, um, but not as much as I think that as they were hoping initially. Is the sort of short version of that. Um, do you have any observations on proximity of wild turtles to repatriate turtles? Were the 10 lost in quotation turtles closer to established wild turtles? This is an interesting question. So were repatriated turtle, did we see wild turtles in the same areas at the same time as is that what is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's about you know their we impacts actually, of existing populations. We actually did on a couple instances where um, we were tracking a female, and then all of a sudden, just to the left, there's like a there's a head sticking out of the water, and it's like, well, is that her? And it's like, turn the radio over on her. It's like, no, that's not her. That's a wild turtle. It's a completely different animal. So, um, it does happen. Uh, we do we do see wild turtles in the same areas uh, cruising around, and then obviously from the preliminary sites we know that there's turtles in at least some of these places where we trapped where they're still hanging around. We still have turtle. We have very few, but there are a couple turtles that still kind of set up around the release the area they're released in, and so I assume that they have interactions with wild turtles there. Good stuff. So uh, we were saved by uh, by day. Uh, he chimed in and said there were tw uh, twenty eight to thirty five eggs per clutch. Typical. Most females nest in most years, and females females seem to achieve uh, sexual maturity at thirteen to eighteen years. So, thank you for the assist there, day. Um, and then, okay, there's still more questions here. Any future plans to look at nesting behavior? It seems like nesting is one of the critical components determining repatriation success. Yeah, uh, nesting is a it's a hot topic item right now for sure. Um, I think that we might get lucky when we are uh, putting the GPS tags on, uh, which we're going to start doing pretty soon here. And so we might get lucky and be able to maybe find some nesting sites and take some kind of microhabitat data of those uh, potentially. But it's just I it's just so rare to see them out nesting. You know, I'd be really hard to study. Um, I don't think I mean our turtles are never out of the water, right? And you know, you go one time a week, the chances of coming across a female that a has eggs and B is going to nest is extremely rare in our situation. We would have to dedicate way more time to being out there on on top of on top of them. I feel like no, definitely. Um, 
Okay. If all if all sub adults were released at Couch Mountain, how is that site different from the others, especially if the all the sub adults died? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. It's it you know, it's it's just what we got, you know, all those turtles came out to basically sulfur red cypress kind of mixed uh in there. And so it's a good question and there's a lot of uh things I don't know about it yet. I mean, it's also been kind of a weird year up there. So at first I thought that sub adults would do really well in that environment because it's a kind of a um, ephemeral creek. And I know that I've personally caught turtles around that size in pretty small creeks, which I think that they might go to avoid bigger turtles. Um, but they've had a really bad drought up there this year. And so a lot of those turtles were semi isolated in a small stretch of river that uh, is just unfortunate, but it's the way it goes. Last year it was, you know, flooding its banks like crazy. And this year it was barely flowing in some places. You could walk across it. So I think that maybe the, it, that there was some environmental conditions there that aren't typical of that area that maybe led to more mortality with sub adults. Very interesting. Uh, have you considered how you might assess territoriality or impacts to the introduced turtles of the introduced turtles to the wild turtles? Yeah, another great question. Yeah, so uh, let me make sure I'm getting this right. How would I assess um, Introducing repatriated turtles and it affecting ter territories of wild. Well, they, I, yeah, they exist. How would it affect the? You know, how would you assess impact in the existing population at the site? I was presuming there is one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like I, like I said, um, you know, it'll be interesting when we can get some radios on the, uh, on the wild turtles. Um, to try to maybe look at some of that stuff, but at the same time, though, we need to try to avoid the same areas as much as possible because I don't want to uh, drown a repatriated turtle by getting it caught in a net, get its radio caught in a net. That's a really good question, though. Seems like if that's if that becomes a more sort of important issue, you know, Obviously, the, there needs to be some baseline, a lot more baseline work done before the repatriation, right? Yeah, um, sure. I mean, you know, in the how these how these uh, animals are interacting is, you know, with with each other is, you know, we don't really know. So. Okay, and I think there's only one more question, uh, which is good timing. So, is there any documented reproduction from the released animals? No. Easy from our from our turtles that we released. Yeah, no, we we haven't observed any reproduction. We we thought that we uh, had a nest one day, but um, we couldn't say for sure. And it, you know, it we didn't want to. We're pretty sure it was not a nest, but for a second there, it looked like we had actually seen where an alligator snapping turtle crawled out. And it was very, very, very close to where one of our females was. And so, you know, we investigated it, but we, we haven't come across anything, uh, you know, anything for sure.